All right, Alexander, let's uh, talk about what is happening in Ukraine. And let's start things off with the bridgehead, the bridgehead in Kherson in Krinki, which uh, was going to be the, the launch pad for Zelensky's uh, Crimea 2.0 offensive. Uh, what is going on with that bridgehead? Well, it, it appears to be disintegrating. Now, um, there were reports about two days ago that the Russian troops have actually raised their flag in the center of Krinki. And there were also reports that a group of Ukrainian soldiers, 135, who had been tasked with being sent to Krinki as part of a troop rotation, that they refused to go there and that they've all been arrested. Now, we've not seen pictures of this flag. And, of course, these reports about these soldiers, these Ukrainian soldiers who refused to go to Krinky, we're not going to get confirmation from any official source about that either. But as I understand it, and this is now information that's coming from a, a, a large assortment of sources, all on the Russian side, we need to accept that, but they're the sort of people who do provide accurate information, is that the bridgehead is all but collapsing, that the Ukrainian soldiers there are barely able to put up any resistance, that the Russians can enter uh, any part of the bridgehead that they want, probably plant flags. They don't stay there for very long because there are still Ukrainian troops on the other side of the river who are able to bomb and shell them. But um, essentially, it's now a tidying up exercise. Within the next couple of days or weeks, probably a week, the whole thing will be cleared. And this whole operation in Krinky, this whole bridgehead, this whole Normandy landing and advance on Crimea across the Dnieper will be finally at an end. The bridgehead has become untenable. The soldiers there, apparently, who are left are few in number, many of them apparently very ill. The conditions in the bridgehead are absolutely hellish. The temperatures are appalling. I mean, they're, you know, we're talking about something like minus 20 on some nights and practically no cover. The whole bridgehead is now a lunar landscape. We've seen, I'm sure you've seen the photos of it. I mean, it's utterly smashed up and devastating. And the ice on the river far from making it easier to supply troops. The troops in Krinki, as some people were saying a few weeks ago, I discussed this at length in my, on my channel, far from making it easier, the ice on the river has made it more complicated. So they are barely able to keep the troops going there. And as I said, the bridgehead is on the brink of collapse. What, what a stupid idea this, this all was. It was a very crazy stupid idea. idea. All, all, also... Yeah. Also, Zelensky can promote his Crimea 2.0. That's what this was all about. Uh, where does this leave? Well, okay, so where does this leave uh, Zelensky? What else is going on on the front lines? And where does this leave Zelensky as far as selling points to the, uh, to the collective West for, for more money and weapons to Ukraine because they have these grand plans? Mm. Well, there's two things to say. Is there, let's actually just go to the front lines. Now, you know, the last time I think we did a program, we both said there is a Christmas lull underway. This is the Christmas week. Things were reasonably quiet. Apparently the weather conditions were pretty bad, but the Russians gave themselves a rest. Then the week that we've just gone through, things started to work up again. And the Russians are putting pressure absolutely everywhere. Now, again, I want to make this very clear. I don't think we're talking here about a general offensive. We're not talking about vast forces moving across the battlefronts. It's just relentless pressure on every part of the front lines. And everywhere you see the Ukrainians now buckling. So um, yesterday, the Russian Defense Ministry confirmed that a village called Veseloye, which is north of Bakhmut, and on the way to an important fortified town called Sivesk, which is very much a linchpin 
of the Ukrainian defences, the Ukraine, the Russian defence ministry confirmed that this particular village, which is on high ground and dominates the area around it, has now been captured by the Russians. There's been lots of talk about fights with this village, um, uh, reports about attacks on it by the Russians. In fact, and in reality, it seems that they actually took physical possession of it several days ago. So you see, this is a good example of how reports from the battlefronts are not always necessarily reliable because uh, people were talking about fights for this particular village after the actual battle for the village had ended and the Russians had gained control. But that's only in one place. So now we see Russian helicopters flying over the northern front lines around Kupiansk. The Russians are said to be advancing there. They're advancing towards this place called Siversk, um, um, and its position is becoming precarious. They're advancing further in the Bakhmut direction, and there's been lots of reports, including from the Russian Defense Ministry, about their advances there. Uh, in Avdeevka, they're heavily bombing Avdeevka itself, again with Russian aircraft, Russian fighter bombers, and they're making further advances around that famous coke plant that everybody's been talking about. But apparently they're gradually um, clearing all the areas uh, around the metropolitan area, and they've already occupied some of the houses of Avdeevka itself. And they're gradually tightening up their control of the supply lines. So the situation in Avdeevka is becoming increasingly precarious. And lastly, we've now had this news from Kerenki. So on every part of the front line, the Russians are pushing forward. And the reasons for this are not difficult to understand. The Ukrainian army is exhausted. The men have not been replaced. The losses, especially during the summer offensive, were huge and have not been replaced. And Ukraine's army is short of ammunition, whereas the Russians have an abundance of it. So the Russians can push forward with limited forces and make gains and improve their positions on every part of the front line. And that is exactly what they're doing. And they're keeping up the pressure. They're giving the Ukrainians no rest. And Ukrainians, Ukrainian um, you know, sources are complaining about this and um, they're burning up Ukrainian reserves and, of course, they're weakening Ukraine all the time. So that, where does this leave Zelensky? You're absolutely right. A couple of days ago, weeks ago, we discussed it on our, one of our programs. He was spinning the story that if, um, you know, we're going to do we, you know, we're going to rebuild, we're going to mobilize all of these forces, all we need is some more weapons, and more equipment, and we are going to then advance on Crimea, we're going to use the Krinky Bridgehead as the launch pad for a further advance on Crimea, and they'd set up all of these task forces on the Ukrainian-controlled West Bank of the Dnieper, and they gave them, gave them these pompous names, Normandy, uh, Omaha, you know, all suggesting there's going to be a D-Day operation. The great Hollywood epic, the next Hollywood epic. You remember at the time of the summer offensive, before you started, you said this was going to, this sounded like a Hollywood epic. And the same was, you know, it, the way they were thinking about selling this the sequel. advance on Crimea, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Summer Offensive 2, <laughs> the, the new advance on Crimea, the advance across the river. And um, over the course of January, before we got this news from Kinky, we had a whole cluster of articles appearing in the American media. Uh, I am not don't mean, you know, the usual media that most people read. I mean the um, sort of publications that the military, industrial and foreign policy complex, those people read foreign policy, foreign affairs, the Wall Street Journal, it must be said. Anyway, they're all coming along saying, you know, there's a pathway to victory. We can still win. Ukraine can still win. All we need to do is give the Ukrainians more weapons and more ammunition, and more equipment and more money. And, you know, they could still defeat the, the Russians, all of this. And you, there's a whole cluster of articles. They all came out 
over the space of a single week. And then, of course, <laughs> the news that the kinky bridgehead is collapsing. So now we have a swerve towards a new narrative. We must help Ukraine. We must provide Ukraine with all the weapons, all the equipment that it needs, because if we don't fight off the Russians in Ukraine, uh, if we don't fight them there, we will have to fight them here. <laughs> this is the new narrative, the domino theory. Uh, uh, um, if the Russians take Ukraine, they will move on to the Baltic states. They will wrap up the Baltic states. We've had articles now in the Daily Telegraph about how we'll be at war with Russia within 20 years. Others are saying within three years, you know, that the looming danger from Russia is growing. There's a long article about this in Bloomberg, about how the Russians are going to come up, you know, it's going to become a militarized revisionist state with this vast army and all these people trained in war. And this is a real danger to the West. So, you know, before, until, you know, about a week ago, 10 days ago, before the clinky collapse, it was all about give Zelensky what he needs because he can still win. Now it's give Zelensky what he needs because if he loses, then Putin is going to come after us. So this is this is the new narrative. This is the new narrative switch. And they started to, to float out this narrative last week when they understood that the crinky thing was 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 finished. Um, you know, a couple of things. You said that Russia is applying pressure with limited, limited uh, forces. I think that's important for for uh, for everyone to to understand. Um, limited, limited forces. Once again, you go back to Putin's quote, which is, you know, we haven't even started yet. Always remember that quote from Putin. We haven't even started yet. But um, my, my question to you is, OK, so you, the bridgehead's gone. Crimea 2.0, the sequel is counteroffensive. The sequel is gone. The, the, the new movie that is being pushed out is, you know, we have to fight them there, over there, so they don't, so we don't have to fight them here. I, I believe Bush floated that one out something like 15 years ago. So they're rehashing that whole narrative. The domino theory, the whole narrative of if we have to, you know, arm Ukraine so they can fight to fight them in Ukraine. Otherwise, they're going to come here and get us. But um, you, you know, it doesn't answer the question, which, which I think is the most important question. Uh, now that Krimke, the, the the path to victory, they were telling us was was this bridgehead. That was the new path to victory. So my question is, what is the path to victory then? What well, is the, the sixty one billion? That they're trying to get to Ukraine and the 50 billion from the EU and the 300 billion in Russian frozen assets. How is this money going to lead to a path to victory? What is the strategic, tactical, the, the, the path to victory now that Krimke's done? Well, there is no path to victory. And I think I think increasingly people do understand this deep down. I mean, you, you do every so often get suggestions about, you know, well, Ukraine should hunker down, go on the defensive, build great elaborate fortified lines. There's an article, by the way, in TASS from a Russian military officer describing the kind of fortified lines that the Russians build, the sheer scale of them. And you, the moment you read that, you know that there is no conceivable way that Ukraine can now reproduce anything like this. Not, not in the conditions in which Ukraine finds itself. But, you know, go on the defensive, then give Ukraine long-range missiles, and the long-range missiles can strike deep into Russia, and that will force Putin to capitulate or the, cause the Russian people to rise up or something like that. Um, the German, the German parliament has had cold feet about this and they voted against sending Ukraine long range missiles, which has come, I think, as something of a shock and as a surprise to people. But it reflects what I think is a change of mood in Germany. But that's a story for another day. Um, so there is that idea floating around. I don't think anybody really believes that the uh, the. the the point, and this is the thing people do need to understand, the purpose of seizing Russian assets, getting more money out of taxpayers, sending more, pumping more money into Ukraine now, is not about 
achieving victory any longer. It is about distributing that money. <laughs> this is what it's all about now. It's all about getting your hands on the money. There are lots and lots of people now who have to be paid off. <laughs> you know, $360 billion may sound a lot to, you know, most of us. But if you stack it all up, if you build up the numbers, it is not that many. So it's not, it's not that much. So that's what it's about now. It's about getting the money, getting the contracts. It, 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 it's universally accepted. This isn't even now controversial that even if Ukraine is given all this money, in fact, it's going to stay in the West. Most of it. It's going to stay in the West. It's going to be given to contractors. It's going to be given to all kinds of people. And of course, lots and lots and lots of it is going to end up in the various accounts and safe, safe deposits and offshore funds and all of that kind of thing. So this is what it's about now. It's more about that than about anything else. And of course, there is an ideological perspective to this. I mean, the British government, which has run out of weapons to send to Ukraine, is run out of weapons, period. I mean, British military position is now all but collapsed F for its own ideological and political reasons. I mean, all that it is now doing, its primary objective now is to try to stop negotiations taking place to try and find a diplomatic solution to this war. So David Cameron goes to Davos, he's our new foreign secretary, and he says, you know, negotiations with Russia is like doing what Neville Chamberlain did in 1938, it's appeasement of the dictator all over again. So there is also an ideological component to all of this, but principally, primarily now, it's about money. Yeah. Yeah, and then, by the way, Alexander, I have to correct you. It's Lord Cameron. Oh, Lord. <laughs> how, could Lord I Cameron. how could I possibly forget that? You're so right. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I would also add in there that for people like Sullivan, there's an election component to getting this money to Ukraine. Uh, we've been talking about that uh, in, in many videos. Uh, so, so they're definitely focused on 2024. And, and it's not only the Democrats, I think the whole Uniparty, you know, uh, Schumer, McConnell, uh, the Trump victory in Iowa freaked them out. And so I imagine that all of them now are saying, you know, we can't have an Afghanistan times 10 collapse happening in 2024, which will give um, the, the orange man a lot of ammo as he uh, goes up against Biden. So I think they're definitely worried about that as well. But, um, you know, I, I always thought to myself when you know, when, when I was in Moscow, I was thinking as I was going through like shopping malls, how many businesses, you know, the Zadas and all these, these, I'm just throwing a name out there, that were forced to leave Russia or perhaps were promised by the Biden White House or the Europeans that this is just going to be a temporary thing, a close up shop for three months. Don't worry about the, the loss that you're going to take. When you come back, you're going to make 10 times the money. We'll make sure of it. I wonder how many business owners, big multinational companies are now uh, complaining to, to Biden and Ursula and saying, you know, well, you, you really screwed us on, on our business uh, operations in Russia. We, we were there 30 years. We built up a name, a brand. We invested in the country. You promised us in three months we'd be back. Putin gone. We'd make 20 times more the profit. We need to get paid. I mean, I, I, I just wonder if there's that type of dynamic going on as well. well. There is undoubtedly that kind of dynamic going on, and it is increasing and it is intensifying. And of course, the place where it is strongest, the two countries where it's probably strongest are Germany and Italy, by the way, because uh, Germany, uh, lots of German businesses invested heavily in Russia. Lots of Italian brands uh, open business in Russia. The Russians had uh, always a strong attraction to Italian brands, as everybody does, but the Russians perhaps especially so. But of course, the point to understand, two points to say about this, of course, these people, the, com the companies that you are talking about, they actually engage in the real economy. They provide, um, they provide 
services and they provide goods. Whereas the people who want money are people who basically just deal in money. I mean, you know, and it is to the second group that the political class is becoming increasingly more beholden to. So, you know, in a sense, you're talking about people from the old real economy as opposed to the new economy, which is very different and very distorted and which we've talked about with people like Michael Hudson, for example. You can see the interview we did with him on the Duran, uh, um, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So the, there is already that difference. Now, of course, these big multinational companies, IKEA, um, you know, LVMH in uh, France, they're becoming worried and concerned. They're seeing their niches being taken, absorbed by Russian businesses, which are taking over from them. Their business in Russia, by the way, was highly profitable. I mean, I happen to know this. This was a very, very good market. I mean, it really was. I mean, it was a well-organized market. Um, um, one heard golden things about the quality of the workforces in Russia and about, you know, how, uh, you know, the payment systems work well. Everything about it was very efficient market, uh, uh, relatively low taxes. They are becoming concerned. And it's possible that in time that will start to carry more weight in some of these, uh, especially in Europe. I mean, America... American and British brands were hardly visible in Russia to any great extent. I mean, the Russians did buy uh, Rolls Royces, obviously the rich ones and Bentleys, but this isn't going to, and they're, they're German owned anyway. But, uh, um, you know, over time, one can see how those people might become increasingly embittered and angry and all of that. But I'm going to suggest that the point when the pressure from those kind of people is going to become really important and really serious so that Western governments have to notice them is going to be when the war is over, when Russia has won, when it's clear that the Russian economy is not going to collapse and they'll be able to turn around and say, well, what was all that about? We, you know, we um, aren't, nothing that you said has worked out we need to lift the sanctions. We need to resume the trade with the Russians because, frankly, we're losing business and it's uh, affecting us and it's affecting our workers and it's affecting our ability to pay your taxes. But, but I think the critical point for those people, as I said, is still some way off. For the moment, Western governments are still able to apply the pressure. They're still able to say the war is ongoing. They're still able to talk about putting more pressure on taxes, you know, oh, sorry, on, on, on companies not to, um, you know, go along with the aggressor and, you know, talk in rhetoric, which you might almost feel suggests we are at war. And the kind of businesses that you're talking about are going to have trouble winning against rhetoric like that. But in time, I agree, they will become important. So give it a year, give it two years when the war is over and the Russians have unequivocally won. And then at that point, they might start to have a serious effect. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, if Russia wants to deal with those companies in the future, that's that's a whole different story. Uh, Lavrov during his uh, 2023 uh, wrap up um, press conference that he gave the other day. He he said that there is no trust. I mean, you listen to Lavrov, and it does sound like there is no uh, returning back to to business as as usual with with the collective West and specifically with with Europe. Yeah, they absolutely. Did have a lot of business ties. Absolutely, that's exactly what he said. It was a very interesting press conference. Three lasted three hours, by the way, and he was in a, I thought, a sort of mellow, quite confident relaxed mood but you know he answered all these questions he actually said that he said there's no trust between russia and the west and the other thing he did by the way is that he also debunked any story 
that there are ongoing negotiations or contacts going on. Because, you know, we every so often we get all these reports, you know, that you know, Richard Haas and his crowd are going to Moscow, um, Zaluzhny and uh, um, um, Gerasimov, the two generals, are talking to each other. Um, Lavrov said, you know, nothing like that is going on. You know, there's a late, there's another rumour apparently floating around that the Ukrainians and the Russians are going to start talks in Geneva. He said, you know, these are just rumours. Don't take them seriously. There's no reality to any of this. At the moment, there are no, there are no significant diplomatic contacts at all. And as far as we're concerned, we're carrying on. We're going to fulfil the objectives of our special military operation. And that's all we have to say. All right. Um, anything else? Wrap up the video. Well, a, a, a very self oh. a very self confident meeting um, by Putin with members of his government the other day. Um, they now definitely think that the growth rate in Russia in twenty twenty three was close to four percent. I mean, that's if you sort of drill through, that's what they said. They see the economy um, surging. Um, there's an article today in Bloomberg telling us that, you know, Russia's about to collapse, the oil revenues have fallen, Putin can't, won't be able to afford to keep the um, uh, economy running. How many articles like that have we seen now? I mean, but the, <laughs> there's also, it must be said, a countervailing article from Newsweek saying straightforwardly the Russians have won the sanctions war. So, you know, you get you get this sort of bifurcation of things, but... Bloomberg, in his head, there's still people who cling on to the idea, that, or at least who want us to think that. Uh, that's more to the point. I mean, they still want to, they still want us to maintain the sanctions and do all of these things because just wait a little, you know, a few weeks of lower oil prices is going to bring the entire Russian house of cards tumbling down. It's not happening. It's not going to it's not going to happen. I mean, we've debunked those stories so many times, but every so often we still get pieces like this. And I think the faster people in the West internalize the fact that the sanctions war, the economic war has ended in defeat, the, the better it will be. <laughs> and the, the companies, of course, that you were talking about just before, of course, they understand that very well. Yeah, well, Orban and Fitzo are uh, are saying that that this thing is over. Absolutely, you know, they're absolutely. Trying their best to to wake everybody up and realize that the sanctions war uh, has been lost. But um, you know, uh, just to wrap things up, uh, Zelensky was in Davos and he made a mess of things with uh, with China specifically. But what a disaster trip from Zelensky and Lavrov during the press conference even said it that the the collective West they understand that that Zelensky's a, a mess. Well, absolutely. They understand this guy's a mess. So I, I don't see how they can change anything around with this guy as, as president. No, and I'm going to say something else. I thought the performance of Ukraine's foreign minister, Kuleba, was um, increasingly bizarre as well. I mean, uh, I mean, he was, you know, basically reading from one thing to the next. I mean, it, it, it was it was becoming increasingly incoherent. But with Zelensky, I mean, he asks for a meeting with the Prime Minister of China. The Prime Minister of China says, look, I'm not interested in not meeting you. This isn't something that, you know, I think is important. So Zelensky then goes off and insults him. He says, you know, you're far beneath my pay grade. I don't meet with someone like you at all, even though it was he who asked for the meeting. I this is disastrous. I mean, it's it's appalling diplomacy. I, I I mean, I would have thought by now that the penny would have dropped with Western governments that this man is impossible. That it's high time he was shuffled off the scene. But I'm going to also say this. I think that for the moment, at least, some countries that had been backing him before are continuing to back him, the British in particular. You won't find anywhere in the British media any reference, for example, to this uh, episode with China. And I think that they want to continue to back him because they want to continue the war. 
I mean, that's the thing to understand. Yeah, just a couple more things that will wrap up the video. Uh, on Zelensky, I agree with you. It's you know, it's moments like 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 that where you see uh, Zelensky lash out at the at the Chinese premier, where you understand that this guy's a, a spoiled actor. I mean, that's that spoiled actor coming out. You see it there at full display. Um, and, and as far as the, the the British are concerned, my question to you is: they they want this war to continue. They've gone hard against Russia really hard against Russia, the, the British and the French, right? And the Germans, okay. All these, all these European countries have gone hard against Russia. But uh, in, in the case of the British, you know, I'm reading articles about uh, steel plants closing, steel factories closing, no more steel production in, in the UK. Um, Russia is, is apparently about to close the, the fishing uh, lanes in, um, in, in the Barents Sea, which is going to, I, I think it's going to cause Trouble. Unfortunately, it's going to be the the working class that's going to pay the price. Yeah. But um, you know, they, they they want to go hard against against Russia. And I just don't see what what are the cards that that they can play, except for the fact that the U.S. is behind us. I mean, everything else seems like every time they're going after the Russians, they're just doing themselves harm. Because you know, the whole steel thing is is to me, it sounds like this is about uh, higher energy costs. It is. And it is. That's about why. Energy. That's why these these plants are not profitable. So where? Why? Why are these? Why are these costs so high? Are they ever going to tell the the British public the truth? No. I mean, the 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 the, the rhetoric from Britain is the most implacable and the most intransigent of all. I mean, the British continue to pump out this line that we must go on supporting Ukraine, we must engineer Putin's defeat. It's become obligatory for everybody within mainstream media and within the major parties, the Labour and Conservative Party, to do this. You're absolutely correct. Britain is in a deep economic malaise. As you said, steel plants are closing, fishing lanes are closing. Now, you know, Britain used to be a major, uh, you know, had major fishing fleet uh, the um, the it's now down, I believe, to twelve fishing vessels. You know, it's that kind of contraction. The fishing ports, which, as you could say, correctly say, are working class communities that used to solidly vote Labour. By the way, once upon a time, they overwhelmingly voted Brexit, which is a strong indication of their um, dissatisfaction and anger. But all of that is disregarded. We still have to continue. And, of course, we're not going to own up with the British public about what the cause of all of these problems is. And um, this notwithstanding that support for the government is collapsing, the, last, the, the, the very last opinion poll that I've seen puts the Conservatives on 20%. Now, that is unprecedented for the Conservative Party in the run-up to a general election. I mean, 20%, I don't think any party, any of the major parties, has scored that kind of low figure since the Second World War, and the Conservative Party, never in their history. So, I mean, you know, we are looking at a potential complete collapse. Labour, by the way, is on 47%, but that's just a default vote. Professor Curtis, who is the person who studies the way in which, you know, voting intentions are, he predicts there's going to be a very low turnout in the election that's coming because people are so dissatisfied. And Change UK, which is the latest variant of UKIP, uh, uh, Brexit Party, all of those, still not formally led by Nigel Farage, that's on 12%. 12%. So the Conservatives are on 20%. Change, uh, change UK's on 12%, and it's not even started properly campaigning yet. That gives you a sense of how, frankly, disillusioned people are in Britain. They sense that they are not being told the truth anymore. All those Ukrainian flags that you used to see everywhere have now vanished, by the way. But the political class cannot change course on the contrary, it's like the captain of the Titanic. He sees the iceberg and he says, 
full steam ahead. <laughs> we can't turn left. We can't turn right. We must just continue in the same direction. Sad to see. All right. Uh, we will end it there. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 15% off all t-shirts. Take care.